Hello, welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. Very excited to have Jonathan Keim with us here today, Communications Director uh, over at the Investor Brand Network, a corporate communications firm. I've had the chance to share the stage with Jonathan uh, at several conferences, actually met initially through FinTech, through cryptocurrency conferences, I think in three or four different states now. Jonathan, pleasure to have you here with us today. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm glad we were able to make it happen. <laughs> and I know you're staying busy. I know you guys are highly active this year. You're generally doing a high volume of physical conferences and want to get into some of the stuff you're seeing with digital conferences. But uh, I was wondering if you could start with uh, your background, give the audience a glimpse into your history. Sure. So I first started trading stocks when I was 15 and through just trying to find the best investment stock newsletters, I came across Quality Stocks. That's the very first brand in Investor Brand Network. And that was in the first year of its inception in 2006. And then February of 2007, I was brought on as just a simple writer. And through the course of some things that happened, uh, I just, I don't know, maybe three months after that, I was promoted communications director and things got you know pretty crazy. And I met Michael McCarthy, the founder um, in Scottsdale, Arizona. He was shocked how young I was, but I was able to handle all the curveballs. So uh, he wanted to keep pitching them to me. And we've been building you know, quite a few different brands ever since. And 14 years, just learned that uh, in the timeline. I think we go back about three years now, 14. That is quite the level of experience. And I imagine you've seen the industry change drastically in that time period. Yes, especially in our core business, which is servicing publicly traded companies. You know, conferences, even though that's a form of sponsored content, it was pretty well received to spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars to get on stage, cover the recording costs and such, and reach larger audiences that way. But when it came to email newsletters, obviously podcasts weren't really a thing, you know, way back in the day. But blogs and message boards and, and other ways of reaching new investors, that had kind of a negative connotation. So you know, we started working with the OTC companies that really had no other choice. And, you know, just, I mean, I suppose you could try to go after PR, but that's almost impossible for many of these OTC companies uh, that aren't um, really attractive in what they do sometimes. Uh, for instance, you know, it could be something like oil and gas. That's pretty hard to, you know, get covered. Uh, but by having our writers dedicated and having, you know, our audiences built in, we're able to get that consistent reach to new audiences. And now we have quite a few NASDAQs. We have an NYSE listed company. Uh, we brought on a Neo Exchange listed company uh, several months ago before they went on that exchange. So we're looking forward to a lot of growth in these senior listing uh, exchanges. Okay. And what is your typical type of client? Is it, you know, a group listing on one of these public exchanges? Is it something more, uh, you know, in cryptocurrency? I know you guys represent emerging verticals such as cannabis. I mean, I imagine it's across the board, but what company size are you generally working with? And what do corporate communications generally entail for them? So our two main businesses would be press releases and what we call core solutions. Press releases, I'd say the average company could be anywhere from a startup of less than a million dollars all the way to, you know, past a billion or two in, in market cap valuation. And it's a great way for us to begin a relationship because it's a lot cheaper than starting on one of our core packages. But for those that want that steady reach to new investors, um, I'd say most market caps of our companies are between 20 million and uh, 500 million. So it does range quite a bit. I mean, we've got some OTCs that have really hit it big. They're NASDAQs today, uh, still working with us. And, and of course, that's helped a lot with you know, our conversations as more and more NASDAQs realize investor conferences aren't going to come back anytime soon. And, and the traditional IR approach is quite difficult. So we already have you know, a 15-year infrastructure if you go back to the beginning, even before I was working here. And uh, it's ready to go. Okay. Now let's talk about press releases for a moment. What, uh, what do you recommend in terms of press releases? What is the best place for a brand to, to start with on their, their first press releases? What type of expectations uh, do you generally project? And you know, how does the whole 
technology? How does the whole program work? How do you get a brand uh, then distributed, their, their messaging distributed, and their audience is aware of that type of communication um, through, through a press release? Sure. So there's different approaches, but the general approach by the main ones like Globe Newswire, PR Newswire, and Business Wire is to first take your news and syndicate it on a bunch of different websites. So whatever you wrote will show up on Yahoo Finance exactly the way you intended and plenty of other places. And then they'll send a copy of that news to maybe journalists in your specific vertical or a local newspaper, radio station, if you do a full national you can pretty much cover them all in all 50 states. And we even do global press releases and handle the translation, especially uh, for the cryptocurrency and, and other you know, more worldwide technologies that want that reach. We can get 56 different countries and 12 different languages and drop those releases at an appropriate time in local time zones. But a lot of people do these press releases thinking that uh, journalists are gonna cover them because their news is so great. Well they're really just a drop in a big, big bucket of all these other press releases coming out you know, that morning, that afternoon, that day, that week. And um, the odds of getting covered are getting slimmer and slimmer. And so one of our key advantages is that after that press release goes out, we'll cover it ourselves. And we've got 5,000 additional outlets, such as Apple News, where none of the other PR news wires or um, other types of uh, competitors like Business Wire are on. And that gets us a lot of direct reach. And then on top of that, we have social media audiences. So you mentioned cannabis, and we have cannabis newswire, CBD wire, hemp wire, and we have enthusiasts in these different industry verticals follow these brands for the latest news in those areas. And then we can reach them through social media, newsletters, and other ways. Very nice. And so going into more of a syndication route versus a journalist picking up gives you the ability to control the messaging. Um, what about the actual coverage? I mean, I imagine a feature at you know, Forbes or Business Insider is going to be getting more visibility than somewhat of a press release. And I know they have contributing author, all different types of community and opt-ed uh, type programs where content is submitted. Uh, what type of visibility does a press release get on one of these sites? So if it's just a basic press release, you know, ideally, uh, like my favorite partner right now is Cinecor Media, as far as new ones to come on board, they run the back end for uh, Dish Network, I'm trying to think here, but Toshiba, Lenovo, uh, different ISPs like CenturyLink. So pretty good coverage there. And our content shows up in the finance section. So, you know, that gets us a lot of visibility. But when it comes to places like Yahoo or um, MarketWatch, unless you're a publicly traded company and we can tag your symbol, odds are very few people are actually going to see that press release. And that's why the direct reach is so important. Or if you don't have that, to have a real PR firm pitching. Because when it comes to reaching these journalists, usually it goes, this is how I explain at conferences, you know, first, they like to write their own story on what they're interested in. You know, they're, they're artists essentially, and you don't tell an artist what to paint. So um, that would be their first choice. And then second choice is going through emails. And generally that is where the PR firms will be pitching. And if it's good enough news, PR firms probably going to be involved, but if they can't find anything they want to cover, then they'll go to press releases and maybe you'll get featured somewhere. Don't tell an artist what to paint. I'm, uh, I'm quoting you on that as, uh, as we speak, writing that down there, and, and a great way to outlook towards it. And I imagine you, your, your network of 5,000 publishers comes in handy there. It becomes very valuable to be able to reach larger audiences with more feature type publications, in a, it, with more feature placements in the publications, in addition to all of the press wires that are going out. Yeah, that's correct. And when you say 5,000 publications, can you give us an example of a few of those for, for finance and yep. fintech? Um, just, just trying to get a feel for, uh, and, you know, let the audience resonate more. I actually know some of these firsthand and I'm always impressed by your guys' ability to create these type of media properties. But, but just to give the audience uh, a taste of uh, what that 5,000 publisher network looks like. So it would include some of our own brands like Cryptocurrency Wire. And we work with quite a few different FinTech events now, such as uh, Benzinga. They have 
an award show that goes on every year. There's Finnovate. We do all of their shows. Uh, usually they do about four to six a year across the country and also into Europe and Asia. And then we have, um, oh, there's a Canadian one that slips my mind. I think it's NFCA. Uh, so, you know, we really appreciate working with Craig and his team there. And so, you know, we can obviously post there anytime that we want. I would also bring in Street Insider, International Business Times, and some others. But one of our keys to success is our ability to reach investors of any publicly traded company. So, for instance, if there's a fintech company you want to reach, or maybe you just want as much visibility as possible, and you're going to go after Visa, MasterCard, or maybe you're not in fintech, maybe you're in um, solar or uh, the electric transportation space, and you want to get right on the official news feed of Tesla, we can do that. So that gives a lot of targeted reach. Tesla news feed. Wow. I don't want to you know, talk pricing or anything, but have some ideas for campaigns that could work on within our own agency. Sure. Um, so, so far more than just a press release, it sounds like you guys are you know, across the board reaching historical investors. That's right. And, you know, the best thing about those news feeds, it's not just tripping off news alerts and such for a lot of visibility that day. It's permanently lodged there. So, you know, going back to the Forbes contributor example, unless it shows up in a search engine, it's probably not going to seen, be seen, you know, for much longer than, you know, a day or two. Uh, this is something that's still there. In fact, you can see our coverage on Nightscope. Uh, they're one of the reg A's that we're working with. Uh, yes. They were recently featured, you know, with Tesla and Workhorse and some others in the space uh, featured. Great uh, case study to point at for all of our equity crowdfunding uh, fans, all of our equity crowdfunding audiences. Uh, definitely top tier, start engine, Reg A plus campaign, um, setting different records to be able to point at. Um, and, you know, without naming names, working on a group, uh, working on a, a campaign of that magnitude, what is the appropriate schedule? What is the volume of press releases, of email communications, of, of news feed placements that you're setting out each month, each quarter? Sure. So we have different levels because, I mean, ideally you're doing a lot, um, you know, arguably too much, but not everybody can afford to do that. Just to kind of give you an idea of our strategies, we have our light version, which I, I would call more of like the holding pattern, uh, which would be two articles a month. Of course, we write them. They're full length. They're really, really good. And then we also do a crypto news break or a network news break or a cannabis news break or, you know, whatever kind of news break makes sense for that company every time they put out a press release as well as every time that we do an article. And there's other rotation that we do with our newsletters and such. I, I have to check with Josh how he's handling it. Uh, we've got 21 newsletters now, but when I was running it, you know, I would make sure, uh, at the time there were only three, I would make sure that there was good rotation for our probably 15 clients at the time. You know, now we've got almost 70. And so I would guess that each one gets featured in some newsletter at least once every two weeks. You know, some are daily, some are weekly, some are monthly newsletters. And then in the case of Nightscope, we first started by featuring them on our podcast. We have uh, stock to me and that's kind of like a premium podcast we've got five others like network news audio uh, cannabis news audio and, and such um, but after that podcast was put out you know we kind of did like a, a cross marketing agenda where we ticker tagged the content on Tesla and other big companies and then drove the traffic to our new podcast so right out of the gate we could just have tons and tons of followers and subscribers Obviously, Nightscope gets a lot of attention, too, and that's another side benefit of syndicating content all over the place. It's not just investors, the general public is stumbling over the content. It's also journalists and reporters, and that can lead to just kind of like a spontaneous PR placement. Sure. I, uh, I really envy the newsletters. Audience data is very important to us. We generally upload it for advertising targeting, build these lists, test it out but don't have opt-ins to where we can send emails directly to the investors. Uh, some of our clients own that data, uh, able to do so in those capacities uh, via content marketing, uh, but, but quite a feat to be able to create 
a newsletter to an investor audience that then produces investments, investor conversions, has that type of effectiveness around it, that type of response rate. Um, so when I hear that, that's, that's what's in the background for me. How are those working out? What, what type of open rate, you know, what type of click through and engagement rate conversion, if you can measure that, are you seeing from these newsletters? What, uh, what type of performance are those things producing? So I'd have to check with Josh again, since I don't run them anymore. Uh, I did happen to see the stats of one we just did for Cryptocurrency Wire for the big African blockchain conference. They've been doing uh, conferences under the Bitcoin events brand for, I don't know, seven years or so. And uh, it, was, it was north of 50% for the open rate. But that can often happen you know, with more of our event focus um, broadcasts and you know, on that note, I, I thought, you know, it might be a good thing to talk about, you know, some of the collaborations, because we didn't get to 70 clients all on our own. You know, we have lots of referral partners, great conferences that we work directly with and, and others. Sure. Sure. And yeah, we'd love to see some different examples or anything like that. You know, the podcast, we try to make as conversational as possible. Sure. And we had some oh. visuals to kind of support with that. If you want to, you know, share, uh, you know, any of those examples directly. Oh, of course. Yeah. So right now we're recording this in our studio and just to show you a couple of different frames and different things we do to keep live calls active and demonstrations way more exciting than, you know, just seeing a typical zoom conversation. I'll just show you a couple. So for instance, this is our common slide. Uh, we generally show this after doing a green screen presentation. Uh, we also have this slide, which is a little bit more animated, cycles through our 500 plus different clients we've worked with over the years, and you know, just gives more to look at as we talk things through. And then we've got our different curtain slides, like this one kind of starts with an animation and then goes to a still shot. And then from there, you know, I can change my title you know, there at the bottom of the screen you know, as we're featuring different brands or as we're talking to different people in different spaces. Sure. And, you know, for any audio listeners looking at different uh, publisher logos here, distribution network logos here, showing the magnitude of the investor uh, brand network uh, as a whole. Uh, Want to talk more about email. Uh, how, how many investors are you reaching with these emails? I know it's a question I get asked from issuers, from brands, uh, you know, in preparation of their investor acquisition campaigns. What, what's the audience size on email? Sure. So when I'm doing a live demonstration, I usually focus more on the size of our social media audience. Okay. And the main reason is transparency. So, and I don't always have the latest stats either. You know, again, that's with Josh, but the thing that's so great about social media is you can see how many followers, how many likes, if there's a difference like on Facebook and, you know, the engagement rates and, and all of that very transparently. And then we also show our Twitter audit score. And, um, you know, if any of your listeners haven't you know, heard of that before, there's a couple of different audit uh, platforms out there, but it's definitely something you want to check, especially if you're relying on a service provider's network to raise awareness. Uh, we've got really high scores, and of course, we're scraping off fake followers to keep it really high. Um, but that, that would be, you know, what I would shift attention to just because you don't have to trust me, you know, how many followers we have or what our open rate could be at this given time. Yeah. And, you know, I get asked a lot about performance. I try to ask the questions that the audience would, would be thinking. So let's say we're working on an equity crowdfunding campaign or a digital asset uh, campaign, either one looking to acquire investors. And, you know, they're setting up their funnel. They're having a, an offering page in place, uh, their own you know, email drip system, perhaps some different lead generation channels to that and they basically want to show some third party validation they want to be able to get those you know as featured by logos on their offering page uh, they'd love to have that content be a traffic source itself and serve as that social proof that you know checkbox of hey this is a good deal and have uh, those organic pieces of content uh, or you know i should say uh, publisher 
um, featured pieces of content, whatever the, the appropriate wording would be there, uh, as it may not be organic with these tools, uh, but uh, to have you know published content then directing to that offering. Um, they're open to what channels to use, open to multiple, multiple touch points. You know, they understand an investor sales cycle and multiple, uh, you know, and, and measuring the frequency within that. Um, but, but what is uh, an approach that they should test out? Um, what, what is um, some of the results that you would project, you know, in terms of a range, you know, on the successful side, you've seen this, at a minimum, they're at least gonna get this type of exposure. How do you set those parameters when you're speaking to a, a client or a prospective group? For sure. So the first thing I always go back to are standard accepted principles because they work really, really well, uh, not just for one type of client and a particular type of industry, but really across all. And, and we have to you know, do that since we service such a wide you know, diversity of, of clients. But um, one of those principles that I, I always go back to is the rule of seven. And you really want to get in front of the same person at least seven times because that's the average number that it takes for someone to finally take notice and take action. And we're not talking about buying product or buying stock or getting involved in a company, maybe just going to your website for the first time or following you on Twitter. So knowing that, you know, we want to make sure that we're constantly featuring our clients in, in our own audiences and then of course, getting on those different channels we talked about before so that they don't get lost in the noise. And um, another thing we do is like podcast pitching, for instance. And, you know, when it comes to earned media or you know, trying to get one of our clients on various podcasts, you know, it, it's not something that you can control. And that to me is kind of frustrating because it's great when I can say, uh, Colleen, we need this article. We need to focus on this. And then we get it edited. We get it approved. And then we get blasted everywhere. Uh, we can you know, quantify that and make sure it happens. On the podcast side, you know, we would make sure that after they're featured, we would get it out on all these different places. Um, but you know, in terms of measuring results and, and this and that, you know, I, would, I would definitely value you know, those one-time podcast appearances or you know, getting on Forbes, you know, this and that. But if you take that back to a dedicated audience every time it happens and tell them, hey, I'm on this podcast next week on another podcast, you know, three weeks later, still being featured. Now it's like, whoa, what is all this buzz? What are they actually doing that's so cool? And that, that would be more of our overall approach. Sure, sure. We try to always have numbers attached to it, but I, I love what you're saying here. Uh, seven touch points, the rule of seven. Uh, we say seven is 17. So the rule of seven fits in perfectly with that. Uh, and like to paint out that user journey and a strategy of where are they first seeing the brand? Uh, what are the other places that they go online? How can there be a presence there for the brand, both paid via advertising, organic from content marketing, earned media, as you put so, so eloquently there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, being able to have that type of presence everywhere they go is, is powerful. It, it says something. Uh, we always want to create that line around the block feeling, which is, you know, directly reflecting what you guys do and, and seeing how it's so valuable. Um, and I've also seen you do it firsthand with, with conferences. And uh, I want to, want to talk a bit about conferences here. So uh, before COVID, uh, you know, lots of uh, travel um, uh, for yourself, I imagine. I think, you know, how, many, how many conferences did you do in 2019? I think you told me a, a very high number at some point. That's correct. We did 19 personally, and then we had several others that other team members went to. I, I don't have the total number. I know that we worked with over 50 events, but we didn't attend all of them in person. And that's what I wanted to, to point out. So we've done some advertising for conferences, been asked to uh, run campaigns um, while in conversations with organizers being on panels. Uh, for, for cryptocurrency specifically, it was an area where conferences had a tough time uh, running Facebook ads and we have systems that we've worked on with our reps there to compliantly run those type of campaigns. Um, so, so we would put together our reports and you know, work on that with the organizers, but I would get to hear about what you guys did and how many of the places, how many of the publishers picked up uh, articles, efforts that you guys were doing for the conferences. Um, can you share a bit about that um, and what you guys uh, were doing for those shows you know, in past years? Uh, and then maybe leading into how that's transitioned for, for digital events this year? Absolutely. So we really just put our network 
to work for them just like we do for our clients. And so we would do general articles on the event, cover, you know, big speakers that are coming in or, you know, the amazing after parties and, and other things that uh, these conferences would push to drive attendance. Of course, we would rotate them in our newsletter. We'd usually have a featured event and then underneath that, anywhere from three to five other events, uh, depending on the time of year and how many, how many conferences were, you know, lined up for that given time. And then if we were coming there and covering them, uh, we would you know, have live tweets and other things going out. And then for investor conferences like Roth, that's our biggest one. We've been working with them for 11 years and they now have 500 presenting companies that come out. Of course, this one was canceled. They were the first large conference to get canceled. I think it was March 17 of this year. And uh, you know, it, it was a big blow, but that was really a hallmark of our transition. So getting into that side, and we had already wrote profiles on all of those companies. And we were already set to distribute to our 5,000 different outlets, ticker tag, each of those different presenting companies. Of course, Roth, they're, they're overjoyed because if, even if these companies didn't put out a press release about attending, our syndicated article would show up like a press release in their official news feed and get them you know, that exposure. And if they had already put through a press release, well, now Roth has taken up two spots in their official news feed. And how are the out for you guys in general? I know you have a very, uh, very well blueprinted follow-up system for yourself for conferences. Um, are, are you seeing that uh, just as uh, effective, just as efficient in the digital space? Do you find that other uh, attendees, exhibitors, speakers are getting the same type of results from conferences, uh, takeaways from digital events this year? So like with anything, there's pros and cons, and you know some of the pros are pretty big, such as tracking. Um, a lot of the conferences we've been working with, each of the attendees register, and if they show up at your virtual booth or to your presentation, you get their contact information. That's never happened before. So that's been super, super positive. I'd say probably the biggest con is that the amount of engagement in terms of minutes spent has plummeted, you know, big time. And, you know, there's ways of driving traffic to your session, not just the day of, but uh, for instance, we're on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, and, and some other OTT platforms. We can take those um, different presentations and make sure that it's not only available on demand, but on their couch. That's a great point, being able to use the conference as a platform not rely on it for the audience as each panel, each keynote can have a different uh, attending count, uh, but being able to drive traffic there. We tested out some stuff this year where we were running uh, advertisements with live video feeds in them, uh, which would actually show up on YouTube live counts. Uh, we've tested a whole list of different advertising channels to drive traffic to presentations before, during, after, for digital assets. Uh, yes, I love the organizational um, abilities that digital conferences open up. We're able to see everyone who looked at your booth, in some cases, uh, engaged with it, everyone you met with, get it right into the follow-up system instead of spending hours on the plane ride home, updating the CRM and everything like that a process I know all too well. Um, what, what do you recommend with for groups post uh, conference? What's a, a good you know, follow-up system? I like to say it's all in the follow-up. Um, have shown yes. uh, quotes here where in the majority of uh, relationships, there's uh, one to two uh, pieces of communication during outreach um, where uh, partnerships occur between the seventh and twelfth contact and you know touches on how valuable the, those follow-ups can be when uh, looking to build a strategic partnership so I mean, what, what type of follow-ups uh, you know coming from the experts someone who does 19 conferences <laughs> a year uh, do, do you uh, recommend to listeners I do have some thoughts and uh, whenever I share thoughts I try not to um, you know just repeat conventional wisdom so first of all full disclosure uh, last year and the year before, 
when we did a lot of conferences. I mean, 2017 was kind of learning how to create a collaboration. Um, but, you know, once we had that nailed down and we were really good at making friends, we had lots of conferences. And one of the, the challenges was the follow-up because if I wasn't packing, I was at a conference or barely keeping up with existing deliverables for existing clients and, and you know, event collaborations that were right around the corner. Sure. So I, I didn't have time to copy and paste emails or figure out something automated. And, and that was, you know, a massive fail. Not to say that, you know, if you didn't trickle in, um, you know, some people got what we were doing right away and they're ready to go or they heard of us before and they were referred and just happened to run into us. And you know, then it, it makes things easy. But that's not really how you, you build and grow a business. So uh, this year, with a lack of traveling, I think I've only went to two events uh, this whole year, actually, uh, the last one being mid-February. But uh, kind of going back to, you know, having a system in place for follow-up, first of all, you really need to group your leads and know where they're at. And I know there's all kinds of different software to do it. Personally, you know, I'm on Salesforce and I still haven't, you know, fully automated things and I don't really want to. I really want to keep things hyper-personal. So one way that I group things up is by date. And, you know, it might be March 15. I, I know I've got a big group there and I've got a big group uh, February 15. I think those are the ones that are not public. And then, you know, you guessed it, 115. So I kind of have my, my <laughs> three big groups uh, based on their industry. I think the 115 ones are, are cannabis. And so when I'm working with my helper that I hired, I can say, you know, this is the group to focus on and I can, you know, rotate them. And I try to make sure that they're, they're hit, you know, once a quarter. So you can see why I've got, you know, three months uh, set aside there. And he'll make sure that not only is it personalized by, you know, dropping the name of a recent meetup or maybe a contact that put us in, in, in connection with each other. Um, he'll also make sure that I didn't recently send an email, receive an email or get a phone call. And then it's just this awkward thing. Well, why are you saying that? I just told you. Um, I also really, really work hard to avoid saying, you know, what are your plans for next month or just following up or, you know, something that's annoying. So you know, typically like after the show, I'd love to send it to, you know, quite a few of my contacts that would love, you know, some of the things that we're discussing here. And it's just, you know, a new way of, of reaching out and, um, you know, seeing something new and, and you never know when it's the right time or what would be the right hook, but kind of taking that personalized approach as, as really paid off big. Oh yeah. And those are great tips there. Uh, I'm thinking back to some of our numbers for, for personal, for in-person conferences where, you know, each attendee uh, on our team uh, would be, be have a 25 to 50 card goal for digital conferences. It's a hundred. We then do, you know, follow-ups from there, uh, three to four messages, depending on the conference uh, conversational. If there's a high enough volume uh, could look at a drip system, but like you said, you know, there can be holes. Hey, you just sent me this. Hey, I got a message asking, you know, how my month's going to be uh, from three other people right before you being able to share content, uh, being able to ask personalized questions, share articles uh, that are aggregated from other sources. I find to all be very valuable being able to complement something they just did on, on social or, you know, uh, in terms of publishing as a whole, uh, content has been a focus for the majority of our clients this year so even just talking about us with, with the podcast we're doing monthly webinars a weekly blog looking for content par partnerships and uh you know areas where we can guest post uh right for the forbes agency council all different things exactly as you mentioned to, to be able to point at and provide value you know why we do this itself we want to see higher success rates industry-wide so provide thought leadership from the experiences we have on a daily basis here and it's a question we don't get too much about conferences so thanks for sharing that background there um want to ask you a tougher question something that fits into a, a pain point for for any entrepreneur what do you do when things aren't working H how do you optimize uh oftentimes i'll measure marketing talent uh, by, by problem solving abilities. So, you know, let's say you're working with a group, you're a month in, two months in, you're getting it out there. 
syndication, you know, it's all, it's all happening. The, the email list numbers are being hit. What, what do you do when the results aren't there to follow? What type of tactics do you deploy at that point? So we would just mix up our hooks. We wouldn't be going after a different set of outlets because we include all outlets with every transmission, with the exception of those within our brand network. Obviously, we're not going to um, send cannabis content to Green Car Stocks brand. So, you know, that, that's a given. But it really comes down to the content and what are we actually saying and why isn't it sticking? Some of our clients, you know, such as those that, are in gold mining or some others where there can be some really wild swings. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do. The best you can do is establish that brand and make sure, you know, it's well known and that there is, you know, steady progress for when things are hot and people are looking back and there's all this, you know, great content. They stayed active. This must be a solid company. That, that would be you know, my answer to that question. But yeah, that is a tough one for sure because it does happen. Absolutely. And even our clients that are seeing the performance benchmarks, the milestones they wanted to reach uh, or greater are still looking to improve things at all points. So uh, I think the hooks are a great, uh, you know, discussion point for a whiteboard meeting for client at those stages. Uh, what about when things are all happening? How, how do uh, groups scale when looking at corporate communications? Is it more frequent uh, types of distribution? Uh, you already said you're going towards your whole network. What do you do when a client's hitting great uh, metrics, great levels of uh, results, and they want to you know, really ramp up those drivers? Sure. So I, I was just thinking about our a la carte, which I did not think about the first time you asked a similar question in, in this realm. Uh, so, for instance, with the ticker tag distributions, we could do more of them. They're you know, an a la carte that you bolt on as you go, uh, ones like Syven. They buy a lot. Uh, they're performing super well, and, and I think they bulk purchase 20 days worth, which we have different um, options. And, and without getting into too much, you know, there's two, three, four, and five-day options, and that's how they can split up their 20 days if, if they'd rather you know, purchase bulk and then split it up versus the one by one. Uh, we also have our contact center in Toronto where we do direct calls to investment advisors, family offices and such. And you know, there's more that we can do on the PR side, more that we can do on the podcast side. And you can always put in more effort and you know, hope to get more results that way. You mentioned podcasts, heard some different uh, updates um, from, from past discussions just in our conversation here today. What, where do you see the future going? What does corporate communication, what do press releases look like next year? five years, 10 years, 20 to 50 years? Are we going to be getting updates in our you know, VR headsets? Is it more of those uh, uh, company-owned management uh, message boards or things along those lines? Where do you see the future of the industry going? So as far as what, what I'm seeing, and I, I was just looking at a recent placement, one of the PR firms was excited about, um, you know, they're working alongside of us with a client, which happens all the time. We're constantly working alongside IR firms and PR firms that are already in place. And that's great. We work great together. Um, you know, Michael's always quick to say, you know, we don't have to be in the front seat. We can be in the back seat. You can put us in the trunk and we just want to be along for the ride and you know, generate our content, get out to as many people as possible and, and, you know, ultimately generate more interest in leads, which also helps them. Well, the placement that was sent over that the CEO, or I think he's a chairman, that he was so excited about, well, I'm pretty sure it was a sponsored post. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll just leave it at that. But, you know, going back to, you know, where are things going for podcasts and, and other forms of media, I, I really think it's going to go to sponsored content. It's going to be all about building the biggest audience and then selling it. And, you know, hey, if people are interested, you know, ads can be very interesting I remember uh, this was way back, but I wouldn't really watch the Super Bowl. I'd wait till the next day and watch the Super Bowl ads. Well, this this year there were ads in order to watch the ads, and I didn't really think about. It. I was just annoyed that I had to watch an ad to see you know this um, Super Bowl commercial. I was getting so much buzz, 
and uh, someone posted a comment under the video, I can't believe we're now watching ads to watch ads. <laughs> and, uh, so again, I, I think, you know, as long as sponsored content can stay interesting and relevant, I, I think it'll be a big thing next year. Yeah, I, I used to create ad products uh, at a mobile ad network. And we were working with print publishers to create their mobile tablet ads, each their own newsstand. We'd run ads um, through a network of them. And that was the ultimate goal, was to be able to create ads that consumers wanted to, to see, the audience wanted to see. Uh, Reward-based advertising was, was showing up uh, at that time, all different types of targeted ads to make it as custom as possible. It's a win for all three sides of the table, uh, publishers, brands, and, and the audience, with the audience uh, you know, being uh, at the forefront. So being able to have sponsored content, having it feel like it's not an ad and something that they, they're even you know, anxiously awaiting is the ultimate goal on the advertising side, having it more uh, inorganic and earned pieces of media as sponsored content. Uh, definitely see that happening more and more. Some of our native ad placements are becoming less spammy and producing more genuine engagement. And they've always been good for prospecting into the funnel, but we use them to nurture and retarget at these points. So can, can see that, uh, you know, really relevant and coming you know, to the table soon here. Um, you know, as we start wrapping up, are there any final recommendations that you have? Any, uh, you know, insights that you want to make sure to leave the audience with? So I think, you always have to put yourself in the shoes of the person reading your content, getting your content, or um, you know, maybe you're working with another provider. You know, what really is most interesting? Not what story you want to tell, but what would captivate that interest very quickly? How can you bring it down to you know, as little as a tweet? I remember when I wrote my first tweet and I was really struggling with, uh, maybe it wasn't my very first tweet, but it was one of them. Uh, you know, the short character requirement, you know, that was just wild. And I was, I was on Facebook all the time where you could pretty much write as much as you wanted. And, you know, if you really force yourself or if a platform like Twitter forces you to uh, keep things short, you get really good at it because you have to be. So I would, I would just leave them with um, you know, the call to action to, you know, stay interesting and, and keep it as short as possible. I think that's the other thing, you know, going into next year, uh, short form content will be, a lot more impactful as a whole than, um, you know, some of these uh, three hour podcasts and such. Yes. On that note, we'll uh, wrap up further here, but couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we subscribe to the 313 method uh, from, from Ryan Bolin. He's done TEDx talks on it. has been on the show as well. You break what you do into to three sentences, then one sentence, then three words, overarching theme being, you know, that that's the space that you can, actually use to get the audience to not absorb, but more importantly, be able to repeat what you do, what the message is, what the offering is. So hitting the right storyline, reflecting competitors and speaking to your target audience's interests, including all the different financial ranges that they're seeking out, you know, in these type of press releases in terms of valuation, price, projections, everything involved, but being able to do it in a small enough window that uh, they could actually digest it on top of all the other media that's being thrown at them on a second to second basis these days. I uh, can see all that being, uh, you know, the right encouragement. And Jonathan, this has been, you know, very valuable type of feedback and insights. If anyone's listening and wants to get in touch with you, if they want to speak with you further about their initiatives, what is the uh, preferred communication channel for you? Well, I love getting new LinkedIn requests. So, you know, feel free to check out more of my story and more of what we're doing in the Investor Brand Network there. And if you'd prefer to email me directly, you can do so, jonathan.keim at investorbrandnetwork.com. But of course, it'd be easier to, you know, to find me than to uh, figure out how to spell out my first and last name. <laughs> there you go. Uh, K-E-I-M for any audio listeners all there. And Jonathan, thanks again. This has been a blast. I'll be connecting with you on some upcoming digital conferences. Look forward to seeing you at physical conferences as things uh, progress here in the 21, 2022. And uh, thanks again for being on today. Sounds awesome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me.